It's fantastic seeing you. What a great audience. And when I look at the audience, I recognize many of you who have already participated at last year's event. Also, welcome to those of you participating for the first time. And what really excites us is being in this great setting, completely different to our daily office lives, I would say, or home office lives. And this is the reason also why I want to thank you for joining us, although we want to talk about business. Looking at you and uh, the audience in the live stream, I'm really excited. So also from my side, thanks a lot for joining our event this year. We need to tell you a story. When we prepared for the meeting, we thought, what could be most interesting for you? What should we share? Then we thought, okay, it's probably the pink elephant in the room. If you look at our innovation bubble, we are all involved somehow in innovation theater. Yes, we know the situations in our organizations are quite different, but still, one or the other version of innovation theater takes place in our organizations. So if this indeed is true, we thought, okay, what should then be an attractive title of our presentation today? We thought, okay, from innovation theater to business impact, or how to overcome the innovation theater. But you see how we've ended. Somehow we lost the confidence, and now we put a question mark behind. Is it even possible to overcome the innovation theater? Well, let's see. Today we have numerous first-class speakers on stage. Among them, for example, Professor Charles O'Reilly from Stanford Graduate School of Business. So, Charles, so at least, please, you, we thought we have to start how we've learned at university. Let's start with a proper definition. What is innovation theater? What we can find in many corporates are innovation hubs or innovation departments with fancy rooms. Sometimes they are even equipped with table tennis, brainstorming sessions, sometimes based on design thinking are held there, ideas are collected, and all of this is meant to foster innovation and creativity in the end. But when we look behind the scenes, in many cases, from our experience, from our point of view, there is only a limited amount of business impact. And don't get me wrong, inspiring working conditions are very important but it's not sufficient to generate business impact. And there's another issue. The situation in which basically every idea in an organization is welcome. So there is no clear strategic fit. Every idea counts. Every idea can be somehow validated or incubated. And it's also totally unclear which KPIs regarding selection criteria or funding criteria are being chosen. The selection of innovation projects is very often influenced by the so-called HIPPO effect. And HIPPO stands for highest paid person's opinion. And you can imagine when such a person decides about the destiny of an innovation project, I don't really think that it's usually allowed to fail. What do you think? So the HIPPO effect is one of the biggest barriers to evidence-based decision-making. And there's something which goes beyond. It's the technology focus only. So if you look at our organizations like Siemens and Bosch, we have 10,000s of engineers, and this is good so. And what are engineers doing? Well, they are developing tech. And again, this is good so. The challenge is that technology development alone, without proper consideration of the necessary business model, leads very often to a situation that a startup idea is not successful. And there's something else to add. The hobby innovator after business hours. This is this typical notion when we allow our associates maybe to work 10% or 20% on their respective idea, so instead of starting on a Monday morning, what they should do, they're somehow allowed to start on a Friday afternoon. And very often what happens, then they also work over weekends, 
and this provides additional pressure to their family and friendship life. Making investment decisions based on pitches is, I would say, quite common in many corporations. The risk is that the stage performance of these teams will decide whether the innovation project will be stopped or funded. And when we talk about funding, we talk about millions of euros. And now I have a question to you. Who of you has already experienced at least one of these elements of innovation theater? Please raise your hand. Uh, okay, who? Oh, many. <laughs> So this seems to be then a topic, we thought so. So if there is, or due to the fact there is this an innovation theater, the, the bigger question is how to overcome it. And then, is it really possible? Well, if you look at former innovation initiatives, innovation projects at our organization, always afterwards arguing what went wrong, what could have done better, why, for example, there was a missing product market fit, the market was too small, the go-to-market was insufficient. That's quite easy to say. But now telling today which innovation projects, which innovation initiatives as such will be um, successful is literally impossible. There is simply not that crystal ball, so you can't predict the future. Or maybe let's ask the audience, someone might have a crystal ball to predict the future. So, who has a crystal ball? Is there someone? Oh, okay. Um, I want you to have on stage and to explain that, how you predict the future. And if you do so, I would love to know why you're in this building, yeah? You <laughs> could be in the south of France on a nice boat, yeah, when you predict the future. But... Okay, so I see um, no, no true behind it. So... A magic spell would be even enough for me. Who has a magic spell to predict the future, of course? Okay, no one? No one. AI-driven. AI driven. That doesn't count, okay? <laughs> Today, it's, it, it's not technology-focused, yeah? Never give up. We come yeah. back to that. Yeah, we, yeah, good. yeah that's good. Yeah. I like this. Okay, yeah. So... Uwe and me, we are prepared, yeah? We have brought one, and we would love to share our magic spell with you. Now, to our first part, let's talk about the horizons of growth. Horizon one addresses the core business, the current core portfolio. Horizon two is about adjacent business, and the horizon three describes all the innovation activities beyond the core, the exploratory business. And this model addresses the question of how companies on the one hand are optimizing their current core portfolio, and on the other hand, they are exploring new ideas. And many corporates out there, they are excellent. They are really excellent at the optimization of their current business model. And as a result, many innovation projects, they don't get enough resources, they are even stopped. And successful companies, they manage all three horizons simultaneously. In order to generate growth in horizon two and three, in the adjacent and the beyond business, we encourage you to work with hunting zones. And a hunting zone is a market area in which companies see enough relevant customer problems that they can solve. And a hunting zone results, or the sweet spot, results from emerging customer problems, mega trends, favorable market conditions, and last but not least, companies' capabilities. And an example for a hunting zone at Siemens Digital Industries might be vertical farming within the area of agriculture. And for Bosch, for example, it could be the fuel cell business. So, first takeaway, obviously, we encourage you to define purposeful and ambitious, bold hunting zones, not only for your core businesses, but also for your adjacent and beyond business opportunities. And you see, with that, we are coming to the first element 
of the magic spell, which is H-U. You have to pronounce it in German, it's who. So we have to practice this, obviously, exactly. We have to practice. At three, please. One, two, three. Ooh. Mm. Uh. I think. Uh. Let's go at least for 100% already right now. One, two, three. Ooh. Yeah, I like it. Very good. Better. Thanks a lot. Even if an organization has an established strategy and strategic ambitions in core adjacent and beyond, there's the next element. It's the corporate culture. And very often there seems to be a mislink, a mismatch between the corporate culture and the corporate strategy. One definition of corporate culture is how, for example, your associates need to act, behave, to execute the respective strategy. This topic is so important that we decided there shall be one major part of the corporate innovation fusion this year. And therefore, you see that's already the second element of our magic spell, see you for culture. This study shows the reason why startups fail. And by the way, this is also applicable to corporate startups. Yeah? This is very similar. And the main reason, the reason number one, why corporate startups fail is that there is a lack of customers who are willing to pay. And that means that there is no market. And if you want to build a successful startup, you need to consider all three pillars of innovation. Desirability means that there is a customer need out there. Feasibility builds on the strengths, on your existing strengths in the company. And profitability includes a sustainable business model. And now let's have a closer look at what Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon, describes as a basic condition for innovation success. If we in our companies, if we managed to increase the number of experiments we're running, at the same time, we can increase the likelihood that a successful innovation will result. And Bezos, he's not just saying it, he really walks the talk. And in recent years, Amazon killed around 60 projects. We have picked three of them that we want to show you. First of all, some of you have maybe heard already about Firephone. It's, or it was the first Amazon smartphone. Or probably you've heard about Whole Foods or the video game Crucible. And all of these examples, they have one thing in common. They are very expensive. And most companies out there they can't afford such expensive experiments. And the good news is that there is a way to run capital-efficient experiments. The trick is to do so to apply leading KPIs for early-stage innovation projects. The challenge is that for early-stage innovation projects, it's not possible to apply the leading KPIs like ROI, profitability, at early stages. Again, of course, these, these KPIs you can use for later stage innovation projects, but early on it's not possible. You have to use this set of um, KPIs like value capture, value delivery, the market attractiveness, the team, and also the question whether your business idea is really repeatable. So that's the challenge to apply a different set of KPIs for your innovation project. And there's something else to do. Traditionally, if you look at our organizations, we are placing bets on a few of innovation projects. So typically, five, seven, eight big innovation projects, depending certainly also uh, on the size of the respective organization. And what is the expectation, at least of the past? Well, these innovation projects, they have to be successful. The challenge is that they are not, for the reasons Karina pointed out earlier on. So there is a better approach. We call this systematic innovation funnel, which means we are testing numerous innovation projects at the same point in time, according to their different maturity stages, and we identify those very few innovation projects which have the potential to scale. This brings us to the next element, the magic spell. It's the rigorous validation process. 
So as you can see, we are able to stop more than 90% of the innovation projects early stage and just leave sort of 10% without a fixed quota into the incubation phase. So you see that's the next element of our magic spell, VA for validation. And again, and I need your support. We need your support. Exactly. Uh, HUKOVA, remember, starts with the German H. HUKOVA at three. One, two, three. HUKOVA. Yeah, it's good. It's I okay. like it. It's okay. Let's move uh, on. Thanks. We have learned from Uwe that only 10% of the innovation projects have business potential. That means that 90% they need to be stopped. And no one likes to be in the situation to fail or to, to, to really stop. It means failure nowadays in our corporations. But in the field of innovation, it's part of the game to quickly determine whether an innovation project can be a success or not. Therefore, we have introduced that we no longer speak about failure, but we speak about the successful validation and the successful invalidation of innovation projects. And we celebrate both equally, the successful validation as well as the successful invalidation. Now we are adding another element to our magic spell, ST for stop. The question is, if it's really the right way for an innovation team after a successful validation to move directly into scaling. We believe it's definitely not. Validation is all about testing hypotheses and proving the customer's willingness to pay. The next step is to leverage the power of the core organization in order to move from piloting to a broad commercialization. And therefore, we need to closely collaborate with sales, marketing, product management, and production. The step between a validation, a successful validation, and scaling is called incubation. And what's the success or one element of success during the incubation phase? Towards the end of the validation, we ask our innovation teams to attract first customers. So they're going towards the early adopters. But in the incubation phase, you have to prove whether indeed you are able to achieve or to reach the mass market. And for this, you need a, what we call a repeatable sales process. So first of all, a sales process at all and that you, in a similar way, attract, you deliver your service or product, and you can prove that you actually can, in a profitable way, sell your solution. And if you can do that again and again, for example, from 1 to 10, from 10 to 100 customers, then you can assume that probably you are working on a repeatable sales process and hopefully also a scalable business opportunities. And this brings me back to the criteria again. Whereas in the early phases, it is about defining and validating the hypotheses. In the incubation phase, it's crucial to make sure that you're actually able to implement these criteria and make them happen in reality in your respective organizations. So with other words, you have to turn all deliverables from red into green. With other words, you can see that the incubation phase is a quite tricky phase. We have observed that also still many, many organizations fail in this phase. And why is this the case? Because Charles would call it probably it's the typical ambidextrous challenge. Why? Because that startup, that corporate startup, more and more gets closer to the mother chip, to the corporate organization, and they're relying more and more on the key processes, sales, marketing, legal, purchasing, and this balance is required, that on one hand side, you can use as an organization at a startup these, these services. On, other, on the other side, you have to prove that really you can scale at the same time your respective venture. And if you are failing there again, you could also argue all money spent in earlier phases of the innovation process is just a costly hobby. 
So you see, we have another element of our magic spell, I-N, which stands for incubation. So Karina, we have to practice this again. Huku Vastin. So audience, please. At three, Huku Vastin. One, two, three. That was like um, a bit 40, better. Yeah. Forty percent. Let's give them fifty. Okay, fifty. But they can do better. They can do better. I'm sure they can do better. At three. One, two, three. I like it. Thanks yeah. a lot. Keep that spirit. Yeah, but could be could be better the next time. But it's good for for the beginning. There's another element of success. We call it balance your innovation portfolio. So portfolio management for the existing core businesses with the classical activities, fix their close, I think that's not really new for us, not at all. New is to apply a similar logic to your adjacent and beyond business projects and to find out how are they progressing over time, how are they performing against each other, and based on that, for example, you can decide which project to further fund, and which projects to stop. And it's very important to show transparency about the innovation projects, about the maturity of the innovation projects, especially to internal investors. Therefore, we are doing maturity assessments, we call it, and the results of these maturity assessments, they are used in order to create such a portfolio view that Uwe described right now. And we are doing these maturity assessments at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end of each phase for every innovation project. And you have learned about the three horizons earlier on. And from our point of view, it's important to do top-down um, division of the investments into the three horizons. That would mean, for example, 70% of investments into our core business, round about 20% in the adjacent business, and the remaining 10% for the exploratory business. Now we're adding another element to our magic spell, PO for portfolio. Internal and external collaboration is also very important, essential, even essential for innovation success. Nowadays, everyone is talking about business ecosystems and partner management. And one of the main characteristics of business ecosystems is that there are interconnected relationships between the various stakeholders, such as customers, suppliers, partners, and even competitors. And Ecosystems, they thrive on mutually beneficial relationships between these various partners, and they give and they receive value. And last but not least, these business ecosystems, they need to be adaptable to changing market conditions, to changing customer needs, as well as to technological advancements. There is another important piece in the context of collaboration. It's outside in innovation. So in other words, the cooperation with startups. If you look at successful startups around the globe, you will find out that usually they work on promising topics two to three years earlier than the average corporate organizations. And very important, they are working on way higher innovation budgets than we can ever had, have in the room here, and also in the live stream, certainly. Therefore, you see that collaboration with startups totally makes sense, and you can fuel not only your existing businesses while improving, for example, your value proposition, you can also use them to increase efficiency in your organization, but also very important, once you want to incubate, scale your innovation projects, also startups are a very valuable source if you look, for example, at your missing capabilities and they can provide these. To summarize collaboration, ecosystem and partner management is key. Second, outside in innovation, and not to forget, third, 
cross-functional and diverse teams. I think that's also key if you look at your innovation projects. I always say you can't have uh, just engineers that won't work, but also to be fair, I'm not. Yeah, if you have administration, only business administration guys in the team, it definitely won't work. So therefore, you always have to have a diverse team, not only regarding what they started. So you see another element of our magic spell, and it seems to be complete. Huko was dem poko. To summarize it again, HU stands for hunting zones, CU for culture, VA for validation, ST for stopping projects, IN for incubation, PO for portfolio, and seventh, CO for collaboration. So there is that magic spell, and we encourage you to apply in your reality, which is different in your organization, this magic spell to really drive evidence-based innovation to your success in your organization. Yeah, and I would say if you have alternative magic spells, then come talk to us and we would love to discuss it with you, definitely. I think now it's time to try it again, right? It's completed. We want to have all your energy. Please fill up the room with the energy. Let it all out. We try it now. At three. Huko was One, two, three. It's good, yeah? 60%, I would say. I'm with you, 60%, definitely, yeah, yeah. You don't give them all, huh? No. Okay. okay, once again, show me that you're present, all your energy, I, I want to feel the vibrations in the room, okay? Please repeat at three. One, two, three. Hey, yeah, good. Very good. But I didn't feel the vibrations, yeah? <laughs> I, 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 I need goosebumps, yeah? Otherwise, I will not be happy today, yeah? Goosebumps. Okay, and I promise you, if you don't give 200%, 100 is not enough. 200. 200, okay, okay. 200, yeah? Good is not enough, yeah? We want 200. Uwe and me, we will not leave the stage today. So, sorry other speakers, um, you can listen to us. I don't know what we're going to tell them, but we won't leave the stage. So please repeat once again, at three, all your energy. Give me all your energy. You know, I hope you didn't forget. It's Huko was dem poko. One, two, three. Huko 